That's right. Five o'clock Eastern. We're back. It's another brand new episode of What Are Your Thoughts? I'm here with my co-host, as always, Michael Batnick. Michael, say hello. Hello, what hello. Is that? is that the tangerine? Tangerine. Can't Very go wrong. Nice. Hey, uh, I learned something this summer. Girls is players, too. Are you aware Excuse of this? Me? Girls what? Girls is players, too. You know what I'm saying? I am not. It's not just the fellas. Sometimes girls can be players, too. What are you talking about? I'm just, tell- I'm just telling you. This is the... This is this is the a Zion world. thing? I don't understand what's oh, happening. God, no. <laughs> I don't Definitely understand what's happening. There. I'm just telling you, girls as players do. Is that a just phrase? Be, just, is that yeah, a lyric? Just be, <laughs> is that just a lyric? Be aware. Just be aware. All right. We have a lot to do. Um, first things first. I want everyone who has not yet subscribed to the channel to go ahead and subscribe. And you can tell people that you were among the first 125,000 subscribers to the compound channel on YouTube. It's very easy. Click the button. Thanks, Koala. Click the button and become part of the tribe. We want you in the, in the, in the mix. And when you subscribe, the cool thing that happens is when we're about to go live, you get a notification. So you don't have to be like, oh, I missed that. I wish I was there. We want you guys to be here for the live. No, uh, I just noticed. No, I just noticed your, your handle for today's show is interesting considering that you've fallen off going eight miles an hour. Why do you keep saying fall <laughs> off when I fly off? It's different. It's different. And never going eight miles an hour. Come on. You're going uh, Fine. 11. All right. Today's show is brought to you by our friends at Y Charts. They've got this new thing, a new study, a paper, if you will. They looked at managing rising rate environments, which portfolios and asset classes perform best. And there's not, Ooh. not a ton of cycles, but they did a really good job breaking it down. And the TLDRs. No single asset class, this is not going to surprise anybody, but maybe it will. No single asset class performs what's so funny. <laughs> the comments <laughs> at you not knowing the number one song in America is mind boggling to people. They can't believe what is it. That? Who is that? Meatloaf? I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't know who it is. Yeah, it's Meatloaf. Very good. Is that Taylor Swift? Uh, her name is Coily Ray, and she oh, is. Oh, Coily Ray, of course. Well, I mean. No, I don't, right. know that, I don't know who that is. Your kids, your kids will tell you. Go ahead. I don't know who that is. Okay. So anyway, the TLDR in this paper, and we'll link to it in the show notes, is that no single asset class performs best during periods of rising rates. And as usual, a portfolio where you're not you know, ripping things out as they're not working is the best course of action. So link to that. Read to that. That doesn't do make people, any sense. How Let's do people sh- read that? They click the, the, sh- click the link below us? Okay. Show notes. Um, I took a look at this paper. I thought it was pretty well done. They should do more. Uh, Why charge should do more they stuff do, they, like this. Before we start the show, any more hikes for the end of the, for the rest of the year? Or are they done? I mean, girls is play is too. So I feel like anything can happen. Uh, I want to. I want a very quick shout out to uh, to the pound. We love seeing you guys here for the live. Jay Luther, Cliff Peebles, Bob Sacamano is here. James Sykes, John Carla. I know I'm missing a million people. Just want to say thank you to you guys. All right. Uh, Mike Wilson, I thought, did a very good job of explaining why they are not wrong at Morgan Stanley. They're just early. And his argument, I found his arguments to be like really compelling and worth pointing out. And my favorite thing about Mike is that he's been very right during some crucial moments in the market over the last couple of years. But when he's wrong or early or, or neither or late, he says, this is what we got wrong. So I just want to kind of talk about this concept of, yeah, I hope you enjoyed the rally in the first half. Unfortunately, get ready for a rude awakening. So I'm just going to quote Mike, and then I want to get your reaction to it, okay? See? Yes? For those who don't know, Mike Wilson is the chief strategist at Morgan Stanley. Uh, And I think right now, probably one of the most highly regarded uh, strategists on the street. Quote, over the past several months, sentiment and positioning has turned outright bullish as both retail and institutional investor sentiment has reached its highest level in over two years and registered readings in the top quintile of the past several decades. We note that the consensus is right about 80% of the time, which means such shifts in sentiment and positioning can often be right as the collective intelligence of the market knows best. However, given our fundamental view on growth, we find it hard to get on board with the current excitement and narrative supporting it. In other words, if second half growth reaccelerates as expected, 
then the bullish narrative being used to support equity prices will be proven correct. If not, many investors may be in for a rude awakening given the very big re reach for risk we are seeing. Time will tell, but suffice it to say, we haven't changed our view on the growth front and we present further evidence today for the more disappointing outcome. Um, this is just one of many charts. This one I didn't pull out of his report. It comes from Bloomberg. This is one of his, the main points he's making is everyone just got really excited about stocks again, right at the moment where global money supply is uh, sh uh, falling fairly rapidly. He also makes the case that uh, we're about to have like a revenue, maybe a revenue shock to the downside as disinflation in the economy starts to speed up. Um, but I want to hear what your, what your initial thoughts are on Mike's premise. Uh, I thought it was mostly good. Okay. He, la he laid out reasons for why one thing that I thought was a bit of malarkey was he said that, um, he didn't anticipate some of the bank rescue stuff being like QE ish. QE. Yeah. Yeah. Which I don't know enough, honestly, to refute that. It just seemed a bit like a bit of a stretch. Um, and the wait, earnings wait, stuff. Part, wait, hold on. Let's back up. So Wilson's talking about how basically the banks were, were I guess, reliquified um, during, the, during the March period, March, April period, where if, if they hadn't been, um, then maybe he would have ended up being right. Like maybe the this, this, this cyclical slowdown would have gained sp steam. Yeah, um, that's the part just, that you disagree with. It just it seemed like a stretch, but I want to look at some of his charts that I thought were compelling. Can we okay. do that? Yeah, let's go. All right, first chart, please. So actually, let me set this up. Chart off. So what we're about to look at is he said like, be careful what you wish for. People are getting all excited that inflation is going down, but he thinks that right. uh, he said, "quote We expect the inflation surprise on the downside to have a directly negative impact." on top line growth that is not in consensus forecast. Okay, interesting. One of the points that he made was if you look at producer prices and revenue growth, they are highly correlated if you lead PPI by four months. So listen, this is a good chart. I like this one. It's showing, again, on the bottom you've got producer prices and on the left you've got uh, S&P 500 sales and they are correlated. So. I just I, I think it's important that we just explain why this 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 stuff matters. Uh, chart off, please. I think the best performing sector this year that's not technology are the industrials, and you know if 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 Mike is right, the ramifications for cyclical stocks, which uh, and and industrial stocks, is going to be uh, much worse than what the market is currently pricing in. Um, I think Sean did some stuff for me for the show today, and he was looking at, like, as an example, the industrial sector. And here, uh, at the start of June, 98% of the XLI's components had an RSI above 70. Um, Is that bad? And that's, uh, I mean, it's, it seems very overbought. And in fact, uh, that was at the start of the month. Today, only 20% have an RSI above 70, meaning they've cooled off and maybe they're not as overbought. Um, the median PE ratio in the XLI is 25. The median forward is 19, with expected earnings per share growth of 14%, 10% uh, next year. If, if Mike Wilson's call is correct, and there's gonna be a more substantial economic slowdown, those numbers are probably unattainable, the, the Fine. earnings growth estimate. I, I am generally of the opinion, and we'll get to this later, that things that are overbought, that's not bearish. Like, should they cool off? Will they cool off? Yeah. But that's a good thing, not a bad thing, when there's excess demand for sure. stocks. All right, next chart. This is uh, one that I think a lot of people have been talking about. ISM manufacturing, or PS PMI, diverging meaningfully from the S&P 500. These things generally track each other. I think the, the, the PMI, this is year-over-year -year change. And you could see a big gap here as there was in uh, – what's, what's the circle? So there was – this thing fell year-over-year. That's go, that's the, going into the pandemic. Part, part of the pandemic. Okay. Yeah. So you can't have the you can't. All right. So to Mike's point, uh, chart back on very quickly. You cannot have that separation continue indefinitely. So one side has to win out. So either um, we start seeing PMIs ticking upward, 
eventually to catch up to what the S&P is doing, or the S&P has a lot of ground to retrace um, to come back to reality. But it's like very unlikely to have that separation persist for very for a very long time. You, is that a fair point? Yes. Okay. So the you next have to have the reacceleration just to justify. This well, is you his don't point. have you don't have to have anything. No, no, no. To his point, he's making the case. The only way to justify the rally we've seen thus far is if, in fact, that spread narrows uh, vis-a-vis growth catching up. And if not, it's a disappointment in the second half. I, I mean, I think it's a powerful point. Yeah, I don't – this next chart, I don't know that I love, and I'll say why in a second. So the next chart shows the NASDAQ price in yellow versus the cumulative advanced decline line. It doesn't go and back far enough. And if you're looking at this – what this shows is just something that's completely unsustainable as if the rally is being led by five stocks. And that's definitely true. But if this were, but I think the next chart just spells it a little bit. Next chart, please. All right. So uh, the orange line of the Q's year to date, holy cow, they're really up 38%. Unbelievable. Yeah. But look at the purple line. It's equal weight. They're, it's up 20%. So is that a big spread? Yeah, it's a huge spread. It's a massive spread. But it's not as if it's meta- Netflix, Google, Apple, and everything else is falling. That's not what's happening. Actually, put that back up. The equal weight's up 20%. I was going to say, equal, if I- For the if first I took, half! It's incredible! If I, if I took out the orange line, and I said, this is the NASDAQ equal weight, the purple. Yeah. You'd, you'd say, be holy like, that's shit, a, bull that's market. A, that's a bull market. <laughs> bull market. <laughs> it, only, it only pales in comparison to the index price. But I think we all understand, you know, What's going on? He also mentions like a lot of the enthusiasm over AI, and he's like, I'm not saying AI is not a big deal, but like 38% NASDAQ rally might be overpricing that at least short term. And, I, and I'm also, I feel that that's a, a somewhat compelling point. I own some of those stocks. Yeah, as, I, I thought most I, people do. I thought his note was mostly reasonable. His, his, the earnings dropping by as much as he's calling for that part, I don't, I don't really know what he's talking about. Um, yeah, let me bottom line this. This is, this is Mike Wilson. Bottom line, we believe equity markets are as stretched as they can get, with market participants wary of missing a potential new bull market. True. Performance remains very narrow, driven by excess liquidity from the depositor bailouts that had to go somewhere. You don't like that point. Okay. The AI theme has provided a legitimate reason to get bullish on some of the largest companies in the index, which explains much of what's been happening in equity markets since late March. Meanwhile, Fiscal support over the past 12 months has been much greater than most realized, including us. This is about to go the other way, just as liquidity is likely to dry up from outsized treasury issuance. Um, a lot of new bonds coming to market, draining liquidity from elsewhere. This combination should support our well below consensus view on earnings driven largely by lower revenue growth as pricing power becomes more elusive for many companies. Right, so we're cheering for inflation declines, but a lot of that decline in inflation is going to be companies, I don't want to say outright having to discount, but certainly slowing the pace of price increases, which is great for the economy, not necessarily great for S&P revenue expectations. All right, let me put a bow on my feelings towards Mike Wilson's bearishness. I respect this more so than people that are turning bullish right now. Like, I don't necessarily agree with his conclusion, but you could call it stubborn. He's, he has his opinions and he's sticking to it, and uh, I respect that. All right, moving on. Yeah, well, by the way, he will be, if he ends up being right, meaning this, this reacceleration in the economy that everyone's excited about, if it fizzles, which I, I, I suppose is, is very possible, uh, he will become begoated on Wall yeah. Street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Will, I agree. He will be like the he will be like the hottest voice on on market. So it's a good bet. And and if it doesn't work out that way, and the S and P finishes plus twenty five percent, all right, life goes yeah. on. I got yeah. that year wrong. Yeah. Okay. Um, this chart. I saw Zero Hedge post this chart. Um, this is the Nasdaq one hundred through the other day. Chart climb. How? I don't know. It's too much. It's not a chart climb at all. Too, too many years. Stop. No. What this, this is every chart year is, since 1994. What so this chart is, lot. what no, it's not. What okay. this chart is very clearly showing, indisputably, is that the Nasdaq 100 has never had a run <laughs> like this <laughs> through June 17th to this extent. So there it is. Wait a never. minute. 
I'm sorry. I have to look for one particular year. 95? 99? 99. I mean, where is it? Oh, it didn't start out this hot. It just no, no, no. It, yeah, hot. it's the blue. It's, it's actually yeah. the best performing one. Yeah, it's hilarious. It's up, up 100%. All right. So uh, <laughs> I was there. Uh, all right. So, yeah, it's a ridiculously hot start to the year. I would love to know. I would love to know if we took out all of the years from here where the NASDAQ was up the prior year, how many years would be left? What? If we took out all of the, all of these spaghetti, put the chart back up. Yeah. Let's say, let's say we narrowed, let's say we cut out all of the years where the NASDAQ was up the year prior. Okay. So in other words, in other words, I want to handicap this for the fact that then how much did the NASDAQ fall last year? Year on the year. I don't know. I know it fell peak to trough 35%. I don't know. 20 it something. probably didn't close that badly, but maybe yeah. it closed down 25%. Okay. So like just I just want to throw that into the conversation that this was not a Nasdaq that came into the year at an all time high. So and there's not a lot of years where the Nasdaq has fallen as much as it fell last year. I know there have been some, but just not that many. So like just asterisk the fact that, hey, this is coming. This is coming off a really okay, dreadful fine. prior year. All right. Uh, but again, just to dispute this notion that it's only five or seven stocks, it's just not true. Chart yeah. on, please. This is the percentage of S&P 500 stocks that are positive over the previous 30 days. Is that 70? And 70%. Yeah. So, right. So you might not have you might not have 50% gains in most stocks, but you have a whole hell of a lot of stocks that are higher uh, than where they were to start this rally. And that number seems to be growing. Where does this usually top out at? 90% it looks like? I think it did get... It got close to 100% a few times. Look, look at where it it's hit only 30 days. Look at where it hit 100% last time. Uh, I suppose that is April of 2020. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you got an epi- It was like 95%. You got an episode back in uh, middle of 2018 where it was 100%. Those were during the, 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 the Trump tax cuts. So it, it very rarely... Uh, it looks like it very rarely can sustain itself so above 90. In, in fairness, the the Nasdaq 100, the what do we say? The QQEW is up 19. percent Yeah. The the equal weight S and P is trash. Like there is a huge huge gap there. So year to date, S and P is up 14. Equal weight's up up 3.9. So what's that, what's down? What's down in the S and P? Is it like healthcare and oil? Is that the main? Is that the main reason why there's such a big gap between equal weight and uh, and market cap weight? Why don't you run through some of the next charts and I'll find this in a sec. Okay, cool. All right. Um, what else are we doing next? Oh, we have an Nvidia chart. So here's why we're showing this. Um, actually, let me get to, let me get to the point. One of the uh, chart chart off, John. I'm sorry. One of the interesting things that's gone on this year is short sellers in some very select Nasdaq stocks have just been absolutely taken to the cleaners. The Wall Street Journal has a big story on this today. I'll quote the journal: Short sellers borrow shares and then sell them, hoping to buy them back at a lower price and pocket the difference. They have added to their bearish wagers in recent weeks, while the S&P 500 climbed to a 14-year high. Um, the index is up 15% year to date. It's up five and a half percent in June alone. The rally has been punishing. Short sellers have incurred roughly $120 billion in mark to market losses this year, including 72 billion in the first half of June. In the first half of June, bearish bets, uh, have lost people $72 billion. I feel like that's Whoa. a very big number. Yeah. That is a big um, number. The list of companies with the biggest short positions is a who's who of the market's hottest stocks. Tesla, Apple, Microsoft, NVIDIA, Amazon. Uh, Tesla overtook Apple for the top spot on June 8th. Of the five, it is by far the highest short interest at 3.3%. I think so Tesla's is the best uh, performing stock. I know oh, it's not. NVIDIA. It's NVIDIA, then Meta, then Tesla. Listen this. Investors shorting Elon Musk's electric vehicle maker are down 78%. Or 12.4 billion this year. Uh, people betting against Nvidia shares are down 105 uh, percent. And remember, you can't really lose more than 100 percent in a long position unless you have leverage. 
you absolutely can lose more than 100% in a short bet if you leave it on and the stock more than doubles, which is the case with, uh, with NVIDIA. I just want to, I want to like just cycle through these charts really quickly. Um, what we're showing you here is year to date performance in percentage terms and percent of shares outstanding. And when you see the percent of shares outstanding decline, short, that are sold short, that are sold short, the percent that are sold short, excuse me, when you see that decline, that's the short sellers getting carried out feed first. So that is obviously the case with NVIDIA. The percentage short was never really high there, um, but still, this is a pretty wow, painful Tesla, thing. Tesla, the bears are gone. That's surprising. Let's go, let's go to the next one, John. Amazon, I think. So the short interest on in Amazon is rising as the share price rises. So yeah, it's a, I guess it's, but it's small. Yeah. Um, let's go to Tesla. This, is, uh, this has been a very tough short this year. And let's look at Apple. Wait, 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 hold on. Stay with Tesla for a sec. Okay. This was peaked at almost 25% in 2019. Yeah, well, I mean. Those, Remember that? Yeah, those, those shorts. Now, one of the things here to keep in mind is that in, in the modern era, a lot of bears are using options trades, and that won't necessarily show up in account of uh, uh, shares sell, sold short. So you have to look at these as like a proxy and not the actual number of bets against companies like Michael Burry when he talks about shorting stocks he's usually doing it in the form of options I think all right Apple and Microsoft is not that interesting but okay all right well, jo anyway. John John go all right all right all right all right go to, go to go to the chart the the chart that I, the scatter plot chart that I made so this is on the bottom it's year to date return mm. and the y-axis is percent sold short so advanced auto parts which I oh, think fuck. look at uh, CarMax <laughs> oh God! So, yeah, CarMax, tons of shorts, and the stock is up. Wow, uh, twenty-five percent year to date. No, more. Oh, yeah, maybe something 30%. like that. Something like that. Yeah, something yeah. Like that. Uh, so, uh, but what's interesting? So, Etsy, they're winning. Etsy, the tons of short stock is down. Zion's tons of short stock is down. Although they probably came in late. Advanced Auto Parts, tons of money been made there. Look at the cruises. Tons of shorts getting destroyed. You know, people just love these stupid cruises. I really don't. <laughs> I, they just can't stop booking cruises. Who would have thought? Can't stop, won't stop. Who would have thought three years later these, these, these cruise lines are back at capacity and ordering new ships? So it's quite, I, I would have thought, I would thought it would have ta taken longer for that to recover as fast as it seems to have recovered. That's really um, amazing. The worst stocks on the year. So the worst stock, Dish Network, without really knowing anything, I feel like this is going to not be around in 10 years. Which one? Dish Network. I mean, it's, what is it, uh, sat satellite cable? It's down 54%. Advanced Auto Parts down 52 And then the rest, it's, it's just regional banks. Key okay. Corp, Zions, Comerica. Okay. Let's Schwab, pivot. Dollar General, whatever. Let's pivot. One of the things that makes uh, Mike Wilson's case harder is that people feel richer uh, again, like almost a reacceleration of household finances. Not everyone, and we're going to talk about. Hey, uh, question for you before we get to this: Was the wealth effect bullshit? No. What do you mean? Was it bullshit? Like people's people's portfolios go down and they stop spending money. Never happened. Um, well, not at three and a half percent unemployment. No, it was not. It was not likely uh, that that you would see that effect. So. Um, most of the time, people's portfolios decline by 20% or more. It's accompanied by falling employment, and it was the opposite yep. this time. Yep. Okay. Um, I, I thought this was interesting, and this comes from Bank of America, and their economics team does such a great job. And one of the things that they were talking about this week is the state of the U.S. consumer. And obviously, this is a really big driver, not only of the economy, but also of the stock market. And so this is just like to level set and let people know where things stand. This gives you some idea of the wealth creation back to the late 80s and in what categories people have uh, debt and where they have assets. And obviously, for the purposes of our show, we focus on that corporate, uh, on that turquoise um, category, which is corporate equities and mutual funds. So this is like people's investments outside of, let's say, bank accounts and you know, as you can see, that's now turning higher again after a really tough year last year. And so one of the points that I wanted to make, chart off, this rally makes no sense, quote unquote, is one of the things that you keep hearing. 
one of the ironies of a stock market rally that's taking place in the face of a weakening economy is that the asset price is going higher can actually bail out um, <sighs> the economy that's turning lower and turn it back up again if the wealth effect is strong enough. And so that once that process is underway, people are like, this rally is divorced from the fundamentals. If it goes on long enough, it becomes the fundamentals. Well, higher and stock prices opens the IPO window, for example. That's, get, that's, and, a, that's a very great example. It yeah. gets the machine cranking. Here's uh, Bank of America. Total, total household assets rose by $3.1 trillion in the first quarter of 2023. The increase was driven by a $2.1 trillion pickup in the value of corporate equities and mutual fund shares, which in turn was because of the strong stock market rally in Q1. Debt securities rose by $890 billion as bonds rallied in the immediate aftermath of the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature. These increases were partially offset by a $610 billion drop in household real estate assets. So real estate prices fell somewhat, but stocks and bonds had such a powerful recovery that on net, household assets actually rose by $3 trillion to start the year. Um, one other thing. Go, oh, go ahead. No, finish, finish. Liquid assets fell by $110 billion, but as of first quarter 2023, they were still $4.4 trillion higher than in Q4 2019. Crazy. So still well ahead of where we were going into the pandemic. This is consistent with our view that although households have burned through some of their excess savings uh, to offset the surge in inflation, the stock of savings is still elevated. This is uh, why this is why yeah. I think this, the st pandemic and the, the stimulus that followed broke every historical relationship. The yield curve just uh, the yield curve inversion is accelerating. Um, nothing makes sense to Mike Wilson's point, but I want to look at this chart one more time. Assets and liabilities, John, if you would. So the bottom is mortgages, right? And credit Mortgage cards. is the biggest category of consumer so, debt. Yeah, so that's, that's the red. And the other liabilities doesn't show up. So you've got real estate in dark blue. You've got stocks and uh, corporate equities and mutual funds in turquoise. I wonder what uh, you got liquid, which is, I guess, cash and money market funds and stuff like that. What do you think other financial assets are? Crypto. Yeah, got to be. <laughs> I don't know. Got to be. Well, uh, I mean, doesn't it say it on the bottom, maybe? What is that, like uh, gold and all? I bet you if I actually read the report and didn't gloss over it, I, had, I would have the answer. I apologize. The, the NBA John, sports next chart. team's got to be in there. Next chart. This is household asset to liability ratio. So here's the debt side of the uh, – and what you can see here is household liquid assets falling – and household uh, ha uh, assets by liabilities. And then you can see a tiny bit of an upturn uh, in that dark blue line. Um, but I, I, again, just the level set. Next chart is household debt balance by type. So this is the liability side. Uh, more, look how big mortgage is. It's like the only thing that matters, it's honestly. It's everything. It's everything, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So everyone now has a 4% or under mortgage. So what are we worried about, right? Uh, here, more than ever before, consumers, this is back to Bank of America, more than ever before, consumers are current on their debt obligations. That's the, the headline. Mortgages are $12 trillion, by far the largest category of household debt. Student loans are the, are the next closest at $1.6 So like nothing even comes close. Auto loans are $1.6 trillion. Credit cards are only a trillion dollars. So there's a lot of focus on credit cards as an economic signal. But as a category of debt, it's just not that big. It's more an indicator. But it matters. The, no, no, no. Everything yeah. matters. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. Um, here, this is important. Importantly, as of Q1 2023, the share of household debt balances that were current rather than late was 97.4%. Just a tenth below its all-time high, which was Q4 2022. Um, so to put that into perspective... The share of balances that were current troughed at 88.1% in the fourth quarter of 09. So let, that's like as bad as it gets. Fourth John, quarter of 09. That, you have that third party collect, collections chart. So this is from this is from the source, the New York Fed. So the right is the the red, I'm sorry. The red is the average collection amount per person, which is not super yeah. relevant. 
but the blue line is percent of consumers with collection. And mm. to the point that Bank of America is making, we're in pretty darn good shape. I've got some more charts in New York Fed to, to dive into. Before you, the, do, before you do that, let me, let me finish with Bank of America. So the one thing they want to point out that's like a, a gray cloud on the horizon and something worth watching, and I can't believe this took this long to show up, while delinquencies overall are subdued, there are two categories that are starting to meaningfully tick up. Is it and auto these, loans and credit cards? Of course. Uh, here's B of A. Serious delinquencies picked up sharply among credit cards in the first quarter of 23. Credit card balances are of particular interest because they are not subject to any interest when they are current, but are subject to highly punitive rates, which have risen further with Fed hikes when they are overdue. So a continued increase in credit card delinquencies could have a large impact on household debt service costs. We also note new delinquencies, which are 30 plus days late, have roughly returned to pre-COVID levels for auto loans and credit cards, though they remain low by historical standards for total household debt. The increase in new delinquencies suggests that serious delinquencies are also likely to pick up in coming quarters. Okay, so not like terrifying, but like, that's the thing that everyone had been expecting to happen for over a year now. You're starting to see the early signs of it. Just like worth balancing the conversation out. John, turn on, please. So the auto loans and credit cards, auto, as you could see, it's the green line, blue is the credit cards, and they are increasing sharply. Now, this is, uh, these are accounts that are transitioning into delinquency, meaning not super late, but 30 days late. Uh, and that even though they are rising pretty sharply, Let's see how they do over the next couple of quarters because they are only back to where they were in pre-pandemic. The, stu the student loan line is hilarious. Well, zero, yeah. zero delinquency. <laughs> oh, of course. Yeah. Uh, well, next chart. How'd, they, how'd that happen? <laughs> so this shows people that are like seriously late, 90 days plus. And auto loans are really where they have been for the last all the years from, say, 15 to 20, right? So Just right. it's 2%. higher, but it's, but it's well within the range. And credit cards, uh, you know, that is something to watch. It's definitely not going the right direction. It's going up pretty quickly. So we'll see. If that we'll gets see. to what? All right. So you see where it says on the right side of the chart, percent of balance. If that mm -hmm. blue credit card line, I guess it's a little under 5% now, like 90 plus uh, days of serious delinquency. If that ticks up from 5% to like 7%, that'd be, that'd be, Twitter, yeah. Twitter is yep. going to be screaming. Yeah, yeah, and rightfully so. That would not be a good sign. That's rightfully good. so. Okay. All right, uh, All right, let's move on to the AI bubble. JP Morgan client survey, are AI stocks in a bubble? This was from June 7th, so it's a bit dated. It's two weeks or 47 trillion NVIDIA market cap points ago. <laughs> um, the Wall Street Journal had a, had a great chart today showing Wait, AI hold this, char hold this chart up. All the yeses are people that didn't catch NVIDIA, <laughs> no sure. and all the noes are people who just bought it. <laughs> Uh, I'm fine, uh, right? Th yeah, there's bit? been a there's been a fivefold increase in the number of call options tied to Nvidia, Intel, and AMD. Well, that's stupid. Uh, yeah. Well, well that's, it is bubble, what it that's is. bubbly. That is what it is. This is this chart might blow your face. Did you know that Nvidia is like a week and a half from passing Amazon if this continues? That's also stupid. St this happen. is stupid. It's, it's probably going to happen. This is legit silly. The next chart puts this into perspective. It's Amazon divided by Nvidia. So listen to this. In 2015, Amazon was 24 times the size of NVIDIA. And it looks like they're oh about God. to reach parity. Wait, 24 Even pre times bigger than NVIDIA? Even pre-pandemic, it was like nine times. Uh, what's really funny is that like NVIDIA's, NVIDIA's business is largely driven by demand from uh, Amazon Web Services. Um, that's... Listen, uh, this is a once in a lifetime stock. I, I've had to have this conversation with a million people who are like, what's the next NVIDIA? Or don't tell me the next NVIDIA, but just tell me if you were looking for it, like where would you look for it? <laughs> are you and, what, and, what, and I don't want tips, but what would the ticker be? Just hypothetically. Yeah, like I'm not gonna hold you responsible, but like what would you guess would be the next NVIDIA? And I'll forget that, 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 I, that it came from you. Totally. Yeah. All right. So no thanks. This is a great headline from the Financial Times. Four week old AI startup raises record hundred five million dollars in European push. Um, mm. four which is 
Yeah, which is obviously dumb. They they don't have a product. They just have they just hired their first few employees a few days ago. But this is a fair quote. There's a pool of 80 to 100 people globally who have the level of experience they have. Top tier talent, competitive. So is it dumb? Yeah, sure it's dumb. But that's, you know. We're it's so early um that we're like still in the phase where like they're doing like aqua hires just to get people that actually speak the language of AI. Like, and they're just throwing money at anybody that like is somewhat competent at explaining it and can represent that they've actually worked in the field. That period of time can't last forever. Could it go on for two years? Totally. I 11 think billion. Is, yeah. 11 a, billion in May from startups was poured into AI. That's in nothing. Tw- just in May. Yeah. In, yeah, but in 2022, it was four and a half billion for the whole year. It's four and a half billion. Now it's 11 for the month of May. I want you to stop and think about. um, Hold on. Let me stop. Okay. Thinking. Go. As Barry would say, stop and think about it. How many startups who were working on something tech six months ago have redone their decks and are including uh, AI and related catchphrases? I I invested in one. Okay. So I would guess that um, you're now going to see money go into AI startups that weren't AI startups six months ago. And they'll just be classified as such because everyone's really excited to say we're investing in AI. If you're a venture capitalist, you're kind of excited to tell your LPs, I found this great AI Dude, play. Y- y- guess what? You cannot miss it. Yeah. If, you're, I, if, if that's you're your a, business. If right, you're if a that's VC, your business. like you can't miss it. That's right. I agree. And all the behavioral stuff that comes as a result of that premise is just what you're going to witness. It's, yeah, it's just crazy. Wait. I've been yeah, saying you, it. You, you think this is dumb, $100 million for a startup with no business? Yeah, just wait. Can I, uh, toot, can I uh, toot my own horn a little? For once, please. This is one of my best calls ever. I, I literally told you in February that, that, that this was – this is me. Uh, that picture up on the right was taken a long time ago. Uh, by a professional photographer who shoots for Sports Illustrated. I'll have you know. Uh, anyway, this is uh, this is the most obvious bubble uh, that I've ever seen coming. And I'm not like one of these guys that's like bubble, bubble, bubble. I saw this a mile away because I understand the the main thing that I understood uh, is is the power of a narrative that literally touches every aspect of everyone's lives. That's why this is going to be bigger than Bitcoin bubble or many other bubbles that we've had uh, in the past. This is, has to be bigger because everyone's going to see AI infiltrate like their job, their career. It's, it's literally going to be unavoidable. And the, the clamor that that's going to create for investable stories is just going to be legendary. I remember so. reading your post and saying, you know what? You're 100% right. So what did I do? I bought AI, the stock AI at 23 where is it now it's now right? at it's now at 44 it should be at a eight zillion. oh but oh <laughs> shit i sold it at 20. oh good trade <laughs> good trade um all right <clears throat> i want to do this thank uh, you for that yeah you got it um i'll spot the <clears throat> next bubble like this maybe in seven years <clears throat> i want to do this thing on on uh crypto we really haven't been talking about crypto for a while because it's just not been interesting it's just lawsuits and arrests but three things recently have occurred that I think uh, are, are like forcing you to, to take a second look at it. Um, this is from John Jeff Roberts at Fortune, just opening the door to this on the BlackRock ETF. Um, the promise of institutional investors pouring into crypto has been something that the crypto bulls have been saying for like 15 years now. Well, and I, I said that in 21. Yeah, I thought it was coming. And if and when it does really come, it will be bullish for Bitcoin's price. I don't know what else. Wait, what do you mean if and when? It's here. It's coming. Is it? Uh... I, to, me, to me, this week this was a watershed right. moment. A watershed moment for crypto. Okay. Uh, I, I think BlackRock is not. All right. So I, I asked uh, Tara Nova today off the air and uh, Steve Weiss and a couple of people I was, I was on the show with today. Like, like the camera was off like. Crypto you had experts. To, well, if you had to guess at BlackRock's motivations was the question. Do, do, they, do they know that they're getting the approval before they even file? Or, um, or do you think they'll get it? And pretty much everybody, like five or six people, were like, 
they're probably going to get it. They're going to get it. They're going to get it. Think so. I don't know. I don't. So, I, don't, so I feel Lee, like it's a coin toss. Why, Dro- why are they going to get it? Lee Drogan had a great tweet. He said, Larry Fink is an extremely powerful Democrat, and the timing of the filing feels very much like a message sending. A shot across Gary and Liz's bow. He's telling them to knock it off. Shout I don't to, think- Shout out to Lee. There's nothing these crypto people love more than a conspiracy. Yeah, but so Lee's then, not like that. I, I, no, come I on know, up. but I'm just saying. Like, so then, so, all right, so then BlackRock gets approval. Then what do you do? You go back to the other 32 people that got denied and give them a chance to resubmit? Yeah. Does Fidelity get approval? Why BlackRock and not Fidelity? I'm, gonna, I'm asking you the tough questions. Why, is, why are they going to or why should they? You, no, what happens? So, oh, everyone got denied without even an explanation. BlackRock somebody, gets it. Some, somebody made a good point that there was... All right, so, so BlackRock, this is from Balchun, has filed... The, 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 uh, the SEC approved 575 of their filings. and denied one. I don't know what the one is. Uh, somebody had a good scoop. I think it might have been Coindesk saying that there's something in the language about the exchange that they're going to be using being like non-manipulatable, which brings us to the other big news this week, which is the exchange EDX that was funded by Citadel and was it BlackRock and NASDAQ? Let me explain what this is. So... Uh, well, I was Citadel, about to you go. Citadel, Virtu, Charles Schwab, Fidelity. These are among the largest traditional finance trading firms in the world. Um, they, they went ahead with this EDX exchange. And what separates it from the shit like FTX and Binance and all the stuff that the SEC wants gone is that they, well, more than this separates it, but a very big key difference. They're not also taking custody where there's the ability to commingle funds or launder money. So you sh- EDX, and the other thing is it's not uh, targeting retail. They're not trying to recruit Robinhood traders. It's an institutional platform. So the idea behind EDX is that you show up to trade, they match you with a buyer or a seller, and then you take your coins and you custody like them other, wherever like every, you want. Like every other exchange. I, thank you. Yeah, That's what an exchange. exchange. An exchange right. should not also be a right. vault holding holding securities indefinitely and probably shouldn't be a brokerage firm either, which is the problem with, I think, Coinbase. It's a problem with a lot of these things. So um, they, they're they underway. It's not an idea. They're doing it. Like it's been going on for a couple of weeks now, according to the reporting that I saw. And, There's also uh, very, that, very unsubstantiated rumors that Fidelity is looking to buy in Coinbase. I'm sorry, not Coinbase, uh, Grayscale. So the- I don't get that at all. The discount clo- is closing rapidly. And when I say closing, okay, it's going from negative 45 to negative 36. John, if you've got this chart, please. But this happened, this happened next one, please. Explain, this ex- basically explain overnight. people what you mean by the so, discount. So, so GBTC was at the epicenter of the entire Bitcoin mania where they were lending to everyone. Everyone got, was, got out over their skis. And this is at the epicenter of the blow up. And if Gensler only allowed this to convert, maybe the debacle with three hours never happens. Maybe that was like their rabbit out of a hat, their, their get out of jail free card that he would just said no to. Um, so if this gets converted to an ETF, you would expect a discount to basically go to zero, right? ETFs don't trade at a big discount or premium. And therefore, given the gap narrowing gbtc is up 107 percent on the year supposedly supposedly one of the major differences between the blackrock trust bitcoin trust and the grayscale bitcoin trust is the fact that with the the blackrock structure investors can take their bitcoins out in kind whereas in the grayscale trust they they don't have that same type of liquidity i think they have to get dollars back and I think there's a very long wait before you can do that or something. Uh, you would probably know more about that than I would. But like, people are trying to understand, I guess what people are trying to understand is, okay, why would the BlackRock Trust proposal look better in the eyes of the regulators than the existing Grayscale, which has already been around for, so I don't know, I, 10 years? I honestly can't speak to the intricacies, but I don't think Gensler is trying to do Silbert any favors. Uh, why? Because Silbert is one of these people that came along and just said, the rules don't apply to us, whereas BlackRock is saying we believe the rules do apply. Is it? I think I mean, that's more that or less. It. I think also BlackRock is a very powerful entity. Uh, 
I agree with that, but the optics, the optics of just granting it to BlackRock and all of the other Van Eck, like real companies that have filed, like, and but don't you have to like kind of, isn't that doesn't that open up the door to all these court cases? A like grayscale grayscale's in a lawsuit with the SEC right now. If if during that lawsuit BlackRock is granted the ability to launch a product very similar to what Grayscale was trying to launch. As I wouldn't their lawyers just say, here, tack this shit on? Yes, it is a similar product, obviously, but there is something in the legal language that makes it different, that makes it potentially more likely for data approval. We'll see how this plays out. One thing that is for sure is that due to all of this SEC allegations, or they're saying all of the other things are securities, people are dumping the, the shit coin meme coins for... Ether and especially Bitcoin, which is now last question. 50 percent of the market cap. Try on, please, question. John. Uh, let me see. The Which green and red doing? bars. So this is Bitcoin market cap dominance, and it's sort of hard to see, but that's fifty percent. It's fifty yeah. percent of the overall market, and that all those red lines going down. That was like meme coin mania. I think that was like twenty one. Um, when Bitcoin was falling relative to Correct. everything else. Correct. Okay, just just in percentage of the market. Correct. Uh, all right. If and when BlackRock gets approval to launch a Bitcoin spot ETF, um, I think that Bitcoin as a percentage of market cap goes to 75. That's prediction one. By the custody of that Coinbase. Yeah. They're using Coinbase as their custodian. Prediction two, Coinbase gets killed anyway. By who? The, uh, the stock. Sellers. Sellers. Why I think would initially, Coinbase get killed? I think Coinbase gaps open on the news, higher, and then people realize, wait a minute, there is now an ETF that retail can own in regular brokerage accounts? Like, that sucking sound out of Coinbase would, could be heard from space. So I think it's initially treated as being bullish for Coinbase, and the stock gaps higher, and I don't I, know that I, I think I don't you, know that you fade that. I don't know that I agree. Moving money's a pain in the ass. There's just a lot of inertia. I don't think if somebody wants to hold Bitcoin and they already hold it at Coinbase, they're not moving to go to Fidelity. If BlackRock, BlackRock gets approval for a Bitcoin ETF, I close my Coinbase account that day. I don't care how much of a pain in the ass it is. I just, I, it, you're telling me I could have regulated one-for-one -one access to the price of Bitcoin versus this what wild about taxes? west what about taxes so you're so you're taxes? gonna move you're gonna set up a wallet and move it like that no you're not you're just gonna leave it i'm gonna leave set it set up a wallet no just give me my cash back what the f what do you mean a... cash back hello you have to pay taxes what do you have gains i'll pay the taxes my just ta to get into an etf no you're not handsome my taxes are significantly less Don't now fucking than they were handsome, in 2021 you're not, you're not doing it i'm just you're not telling doing you. it uh i really think i would i really think i would if i could just own it in a regulated environment i would prefer it Listen, I, there, if, if I were, would you ask me, would I rather own an ETF fresh or own well, it in Coinbase? That's the I'd rather, but a lot of people, are, so you're saying money's going to come out of Coinbase. And I'm saying, no, it's not. People aren't okay, going to what do if, it. It's annoying. What if it doesn't come out, but it never goes in because that it's going somewhere else? That I okay. mostly agree with. I think the market is going to figure that out. Maybe not in the first trade, but ultimately the market is going to figure out, wait a minute. This is not bullish for Coinbase after all. This actually long term is huge competition. Yeah, yeah, so, I agree with that. Is is this how it was always done to end up? Just TradFi just takes over. Yeah, we'll take yeah. it from here. I said this years ago. Yeah. I said the only way this asset class is going to survive is if they abide by the rule of law. That's it. So so I, I no thought I had one more chart in here. Anyway, Bitto got which was the futures ETF got like one point four billion dollars in assets at the peak. GBTC peaked at forty billion. Yeah. I, th I, I would bet that if Tyrone's texting us, what does he say? Uh, that I would bet that if that, hold <laughs> on, hold, hold on, a uh, hundred billion dollars in a, in a BlackRock Bitcoin spot ETF, a hundred, hundred billion dollars in under yeah. three years. Oh, faster than that. That's it. It's a one stop. This is the point I'm trying to make. It's game over. For how? It's for game, Coinbase? It's game or over. For no, who? for every other bullshit, stupid fucking solution. It's like, uh, all right, here is 90 different ways you can get exposure, family office, wealth manager, asset manager. Here's 90 different contraptions you could use to get exposure. Or here's one ETF that trades on the New York Stock Exchange. Yeah. It's all over for these hoes. That's it. <laughs>
This, 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 this is the end. So I, listen, it's bullish for the asset class. It's bearish for a lot of venture back things that are clunky, don't really work, and are constantly being scrutinized and sued by regulators. It's, it's really going to become a one-stop shop. And if you think they'll stop at Bitcoin, I promise you right behind it is the ETH version. Yeah, of course. And if, and if you get Bitcoin and ETH in a liquid ETF that the regulators have allowed to trade and gains market share, it's going to feed on itself in the way that GLD did. It's going to feed on itself in the way that, you know, a lot of other category killer ETFs have because ETFs are one of the areas where first mover, mover advantage matters a lot. Like it's probably not the only driver of assets. Price is important too. But first mover matters a lot in ETFs. So if they get there first, it, I'm telling you, I think it's game over. I know this is not nearly, this is not even an equivalent. So it might not even be worth saying, but how many S&P 500 ETFs have over $10 billion in assets? A dozen? S&P like index ETFs? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe the XLK? No, 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 no. Like, S&P 500. Like SPY, oh, IVV, well, VOO. VOO, and, VOO yeah. is right behind SPY these days, I think. Vanguard's S&P fund yeah. is huge. Anyway, listen, obviously, obviously you could tell, by the way, we're talking that we're not crypto experts, but I do think this was a watershed. This week is a watershed moment for, for yeah, the not, ecosystem. I don't think crypto people are running to the ETF. I'm talking about regular, no, never. Yeah, yeah. Hum, like human beings, like yeah. normal people that don't know anything, like me. There's a lot. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's move on. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, last, you want to do some one. ETFs? Let, let's wrap this up quickly. I don't need to spend a lot of time here. Um, so record high for ETFs. Uh, where do you think this stops? And is this surprising to you at all? Like, where does the money keep coming from? Just inflows, just relentless bids type stuff? Uh, well, as you know, I am very friendly with people from the mutual fund world who are very highly placed executives. And after every sell-off, including the 2022 sell-off, what ends up happening is the market recovers, but the flows to mutual funds do not. Yeah. And I can tell you on very high authority that pretty much every mutual fund company is seeing the same thing that I just described, which is like, all right, great, the market's back, flows should be arriving soon, and they don't because they go to ETFs instead. And I don't, I, I don't know what breaks that cycle. So 10 more sell-offs, you know, the same process, rinse and repeat, yeah. the mutual fund industry is going to be much smaller or it's going to demonstrate a willingness to cannibalize its own products, create ETF versions, accept a lower AUM fee. And that's really how this is going to resolve itself. And I don't know any other way out of it. Yeah. All right. I'm going to skip the next chart. Let's just get to make the case. And before I do make the case, mm. I almost pulled some bullshit. I said, you know what? I'm not going to make the case for anything because everything's extended. And I just want to let people know. I would have, shush I would for have sec. killed shush, you on this show shush, for that. Shush, shush, shush for a sec. So shush, I have 10... Shut, uh, shut your mouth. <laughs> shut your mouth. <laughs> I have 10 stocks. That's my, that's my limit. I've got 10 stocks. They're in my IRA and, uh, they're all positive. I am positive on everything that what I happens not, if you add an 11th, do you turn into a pumpkin? Not because I am smart. Clearly everything is going up. Right. Mm. And so if you're feeling like all balled up, I would, I would urge caution, patience, not for, not, not for dollar cost averaging S and P 500 type stuff. But if you're like chasing Nvidia, especially just like relax, take a breath. All right. With that said, this is a recent purchase of mine, Dollar General. Um, Dollar General. What did, you, what did you sell to make this your 10th? I had, I had cash. I made a contribution so to my IRA. Nine, oh, so you didn't have your 10. Yeah. You didn't have your full lineup. Okay. Yeah, now, now I've got the full team and, and backups. All right, pitch me. Why should I buy it? All right, Dollar General. Uh, just experienced its worst drawdown since it, went, since it went republic. This went private. I think KKR. I think it was KKR back in... Okay. Uh, 2003 maybe it doesn't even matter. this is pretty this is pretty deep pretty bad this is this is like the consumer staple of, of consumer staples mm. uh and it did not sell off because people are dumb it sold off for good reason this is from alex morris a few charts quarterly same store sales uh was like 1.8 percent or something significantly lower than walmart so they they're, they've got some execution issues they didn't they, there was some pricing shenanigans or not shenanigans just miscalculations on their part and if you compare it to family dollar which is a better comp yeah they fucked up they had a bad quarter they cut guidance they withdrew all of their share repurchases for the year next chart please 
So there is definite reason for the sell-off. All right. However, uh, despite there being reason, I, you know, I, I like to buy things uh, when they're on sale. So I think that this is on sale. If you look at the next chart of cash flow from operations and revenue, this is just a pretty boring consumer staple stock that I think just got oversold. And the play here for me is a gap fill. I'm a gap fill guy. Next chart, please. So I did buy it uh, at the recent bottom, which might not be the bottom. And the thing that I really like is that it found support at the 75 month moving average. Next chart, please. Which has historically been a uh, strong support. Not only teasing. This was a joke. Everything okay. else is not. Okay. So buy it or you're, it. you're buying, you just bought it. No, I bought it. I bought it. I bought it. Okay. Bought it last week. Uh, all right. Have you ever been in a dollar general just for reference? I've been in one. So, sir, I've been in, um, I've been in, I go to dollar general all the time upstate. Okay. Uh, I am I, very familiar. I do not have room for a stock like this in my portfolio. I, I just, uh, I hate everything about it. I don't think you're going to lose money though, because that sell off looks way more extended to the downside than the fundamentals would warrant. I'm just, I would buy Louis Vuitton before I bought this. You are and, such a uh, fucking snob. No, I just, I think the fundamentals for lo the luxury category are way better for the category where five or six companies are fighting like over pennies. It's just, it's not the kind of investment that I normally make. So that, that's, all, that's all I'm saying. Uh, all right, I have a mystery chart for you, and it's somewhat related to something that we've been discussing on the show. John, if you please. All right, okay. so let me, let me set this up for you. One of these is uh, one of these is, one of these is a stock, the purple line, and the orange line is a commodity that the stock is related to. Oh, interesting, interesting, interesting. So the orange line the is out. the orange line is the commodity, uh, and the purple line is like the most well-known public uh, company associated with it. Come on, Mike. Um, you got this. Is, is the orange line uh, lumber? All right. Maybe the word commodity is throwing you. Take out commodity and it's just like a thing. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, now that it's a thing, that really narrows it down. Man, dude, I give you right. great clues. I'm sorry. You're giving Reveal. me things. Reveal. Things. Reveal. The orange is Bitcoin and U.S. dollars, which I'm calling a commodity, but some people don't. But the CFTC okay. is supposedly okay. regulating it. All right. The purple is Coinbase. And I think both you and I, a long time ago, and met on many occasions, correctly guessed that ultimately this would happen. That there would be a separation between the two. They wouldn't trade in lockstep forever. And that Bitcoin would be the better bet than the equity in Coinbase. And you and I are becoming more and more right as these two things separate. In fairness, fair? yeah, so I was right. I did not think that Coinbase would trade with Bitcoin forever, and it's not. But it's not. But it's starting I, but to fall I, apart now, though. Yeah, but I was, not, I was not necessarily as bearish, not even close to as bearish on Coinbase as you were. Not even close. Um, well, it hasn't actually been that terrible of a stock, to, depending on when your starting point is. It seems to be pretty stable this year, given how much people are throwing at it. It stopped so. going down. I still would rather own Bitcoin than Coinbase any day of the week, like just just personally, and that is that that is what I am. All right, we've uh, we've done an hour. We're gonna say good night to uh, our our friends in the chat, the mighty mighty pound. We love you guys. Thank you so much for coming out. Please hit the like button if you haven't yet. Make sure you're subscribed. New Animal Spirits first thing tomorrow morning on your favorite podcast platform. All new Compound and Friends at the end of the week. Good night from Michael Batnick and I. Have a Good great night. week.